So, Mark, my first question is, um, tell me a little bit about how your most recent uh, book was born, Return on Influence. Well, it's, it's, it's really a, an interesting uh, idea, Maria. Um, I wrote a blog post about this trend of social influence and clout uh, uh, last November. It was November of 2010. And I had this incredibly violent reaction from the people who read the blog. And they said, how dare you? How, how, how can companies possibly try to rate us in terms of our influence? And every time I wrote something about this, the reaction was the same. There was this huge blow up. Then on the other hand, I was starting to see these stories about companies and big brands adopting uh, social scoring into their mainline marketing efforts. So I had this intersection between personal loathing and business opportunity. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't that make an interesting book? <laughs> so um, I talked to the publisher about it and I wrote up a proposal. And it was unusual because I said, you know, this is so new. Uh, there are no experts. There is no prior research. Um, I don't know how this book is going to go. I'll put together an outline for you, but I'm not going to really know until I get into it. And it turns out, you know, I just kind of opened up this whole field and it's the first book of its kind. I mean, there's never been a book written about this and uh, it explores how power and influence are new. I mean, what's different now on the internet versus the offline world and how companies are using this now to um, help uh, build their brands. <clears throat> you know, when I first saw the, the cover, the, the thing that um, actually caught my attention was the fact that you're actually playing with the uh, ROI question. You know, everybody asks mm. the ROI question. So um, what did you intend to do there with, the, with this kind of, uh, you know, um, similarity in the, uh, in the name? Well, um, you know, one of the things that I teach in my classes is that when you approach the social web from a business standpoint, you need to open your mind as far as the potential business benefits. Now, I am a traditional marketing person. I am a numbers guy. I'm a measurement guy and I want to drive everything to the bottom line. So it's, I'm not, you know, out there fluffy 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 it's all about the conversation that's that's not me at all however I think if you lose sight of the fact that many of the benefits of the social web are qualitative not necessarily quantitative you miss out on a lot and just for an example I do a case study in my class about this uh, example from business. And I have people list all the benefits that they heard from this case study. And they'll say, well, well, people, they, they got a new employee, they got a new relationship, they got a new supplier, they got a new, uh, someone got a mentor. How do you put those things on an Excel spreadsheet? And yet those are undeniable business benefits. So I think in that way, small businesses may actually have an advantage over big businesses because it's apparent. You can just see this stuff happening where with the layers in a big company, there might be more of an expectation of traditional ROI. There's nothing wrong with that. But you also need to expand your mind as to everything else that's uh, available out there that could be really legitimate business benefits. <clears throat> So, um, you know, I have to ask the ROI question as well. <laughs> do you think, do you actually think it can be measured? And what are we missing uh, out, you know, uh, when we, we actually put it in numbers? And uh, moreover, uh, I wanted to ask you what differences there are between small, medium, and big companies in this? Well, I, th I think that there's... There's no question that it can be measured. In fact, I think it can be measured uh, more precisely than almost any type of marketing or advertising we've ever done in history. 
So let's say you have a billboard in one of your cities. What's the ROI of that billboard? How do you measure impressions and connect that to buying behavior? Well, online on the internet, we have so much data that certainly we can start making these uh, connections. So absolutely it can be measured. I think a bigger question though is, and especially for small businesses, is how much does it cost to measure it all the way back to the ROI? I mean, sometimes it's just not practical and you have to take a leap and you say, okay, if I drive visitors to my website and visitors to my shopping cart, you know, eventually that's a leading indicator for my revenue is going to go up. And sometimes you have to take the leap and say that's good enough because it's just going to take me, it's going to, if, if I try to measure ROI, it's going to ruin my ROI. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, when it comes to, uh, for example, I don't know, social commerce, for example. Now, there have been so many uh, experiments and uh, we've, uh, we've seen uh, from, I don't know, Facebook commerce to uh, engaging customers in so many different ways. But sure. um, how do you think um, customers actually relate to brands on Facebook, for example? Is it, is it kind of a different relationship that, than what it was uh, offline? Well, that's a, that's a big question. That's kind of a, a really hot question. And I think there's no way to really answer that you know, business by business or brand by brand. You have to, it's a different business case for everything. So you have a beloved brand like, uh, let's say, BMW or Coca-Cola. Naturally, you're going to have a lot of Facebook engagement because people just love those brands. If you're selling uh, tool and die equipment to the machine shop down the street, why would anybody like you on Facebook? So uh, it's, it, it can be a very, very different business case. I think that Facebook in particular, and of course, you know, there's a different strategy for every single platform. There's a different strategy for LinkedIn or Twitter or YouTube. But Facebook in particular, I think this, the business strategy is, is, can be more or less get, go down to one sentence. And that is, um, come waste time with me. Because nobody needs to go to Facebook. It's all incremental time. So if you're the type of business that um, people want to waste time with, if you have lots of interesting content and deals and contests and excitement, then I think it makes sense to you know do try your hand at, at Facebook. And it doesn't really hurt anything to have a Facebook page, but I think it's the, the, the potential benefits for many businesses is way overblown and way over overestimated. Right. So, do you think that's the reason why uh, you know some research researches show that uh, customers are actually most interested in coupons and deals and offers? Well, sure they are. I mean, they customers want really three things. They want to know how can you save me money, how can you save me time, or how can you help me have more fun. Those are really the basic three things that, that, that almost any customer, whether it's B2C or B2B or whatever it is, those are the three fundamental needs and everything kind of plays off of that. So to the extent that your social media presence can help people with that, then it will be uh, effective. And it's not, not that easy. Um, since we are talking about um, Facebook, there's a question from uh, one of our readers. Uh, mm -hmm. Fabrizio Bellavista, who asks, um, what are the differences in uh, the um, user's perception between a traditional friendship and a Facebook friendship? Oh my gosh, oh, what, what an interesting question. Um, well, let me, let me put it this way. One of the things that I, I talk about in my new book uh, is I compare um, offline relationships and influence with online relationships and influence. And there are two fundamental differences. 
One has to do with reciprocity. And what I mean by that, if you do something nice for someone, for one of your friends in the real world, then people have um, a very strong desire to want to return that favor. So, it, but in the real world, someone will knock on the door, on your door, and say, oh, my, uh, my girlfriend is sick, I need to take her to the hospital, uh, can you watch my dog for a day? So you have to get your skin in the game. It, it, it's, a, it's a commitment, right? And, you, and that person, your friend, is really going to want to pay you back. Now, in the online world, reciprocity is hitting a like button. It's friending somebody. It's tweeting somebody. There's really no commitment involved. And yet, the expectation is the same. So you say, well, I've been tweeting this person. They don't tweet. They never tweet me. Well, I'm getting angry about it. So there is a big difference in the online world and the offline world. The other big difference has to do with something called social proof. And in the offline world, that may be something like, let's say you're at the scene of an accident and there are two people giving directions. One is dressed like a doctor. The other is dressed like someone that works at a fast food restaurant. You're probably more likely to follow the directions of the doctor just because they look like a doctor. That is social proof. That person may not even be a doctor, but when we don't have the, the, enough information to make a decision, we look for these shortcuts, okay? In the online world and our relationships in the online world, including Facebook and the other social media platforms, social proof is much more important because we rarely have the opportunity to actually meet people and to get to know people and you know look at their surroundings and look at their life. And so social proof badges like the number of Facebook friends that you have, the number of likes that you have, the number of Twitter followers or your clout score. That makes a big deal. It's a, it's a, it makes a big difference in the online world. And, and so people, they're surrounded by so much information density that they're, they're, they're desperate to find these shortcuts of social proof to make decisions about you. And one of the theories I have in the book is that social proof like that in the online world is probably more important than your actual accomplishments. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's actually probable. Yeah, I mean, I can guarantee you more people know how many Twitter followers I have than where I went to college or what I do in my community or how I help people in my business. Returning to uh, your book, mm -hmm. uh, when is it going to be available uh, in uh, the stores? Not only the uh, paper edition, but also ebook, if there's going to be one. Yes, of course. Um, well, this is uh, being published by a, a major global uh, publisher, McGraw Hill, um, and uh, it will be. It's it's available on Amazon um, and other online stores right now, and it'll ship uh, probably at the end of February, and uh, should be in bookstores uh, by early March. Good, good. We're gonna have a, a copy of that. Yay! Necessarily. I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> I'm sure I will. And uh, I'd like to ask you more about um, what the points you touch in the book. So mm -hmm. I imagine, mm -hmm. I imagine, and you've already told me that uh, one of the important points is content curation. So mm -hmm. what's your view about that? Well, I think. Um, one of the things that I explore in the book, which is really an entirely new topic, is the new source of power and influence on the web. So let me give you an example um, from my own experience. I mentioned at the beginning of our interview that last November I wrote this blog post about social influence and clout. And a few months later, uh, a reporter from the New York Times called me up and said, look, I've, I'm writing a story about this. I've Googled the subject and your blog post came up. Right. Could, I in, could I interview you for the New York Times? I said, of course. So I ended up being quoted four times 
in the Sunday New York Times. That article was picked up all over the world. It was in the London newspaper. It was in Australia. Now, who am I? Why, why am I suddenly being quoted in the New York Times? Did I graduate from Oxford with an advanced degree? No. Am I a star athlete? No. Am I a movie star? No. So what is my source now of power and influence? Why am I being quoted in the New York Times? It's because I can create content through my blog and it moves through an engaged network on the internet. And to the extent that, that we can create content or curate content and it moves through the internet, that is the new source of power. And that's an important lesson for us to learn as individuals and also as companies and brands that today creating amazing, compelling content uh, and being able to move that through the internet is that is the real source of power today. Now, it gets even more interesting because you think about, okay, if you, if you agree with that idea, then you can take the next step. Can you measure how content moves through the internet? Yes. Can you measure how people react to it? Do they tweet it? Do they retweet it? Do they comment on it? Do they write blogs about your blog? You can measure that too. And so, you know, one, so a key idea is that for the first time, we can really quantify one little piece of influence. And that's what's happening uh, online. And that's what companies like Clout in the United States or Peer Index in London are trying to do.